Welcome, folks. Welcome to the Ramp Up Your Resilience Summit. Just getting things out of my way here. I am Ravi Tangri. I'm going to be your host for this summit. And I'd like to take a moment to just look you through what's happening. First of all, I want to truly, truly thank our sponsors, Gathering for Goodness, Smart Cat Marketing, and Helena St. James. They've really helped us make this possible for you. And over four days, you're going to be seeing uh, uh, an array of amazing speakers to bring in their expertise on resilience. Today is Vince Pacenti, who is with me now. Um, tomorrow, Michelle Cedric, uh, Kate Collins on Wednesday, and Patricia Morgan on Thursday to give you real, real hands on uh, resources and tools. Now, what we've got, just to let you know, is that <clears throat> in this venue, I'm, I'm opening it half an hour before, half an hour after the speakers. <clears throat> you can connect with other participants in the social lounge. So this is not like Zoom where you're going to have 30, 40, 50, 100 people in a world. You can have three, four, five people at a table and have a real conversation to network, connect, and share ideas. Also, in the booths, you're going to find lots of amazing resources that both our sponsors and our speakers have for you. So please take the time to connect, tap into all of those resources. So now it's my absolute pleasure to uh, introduce a, a dear friend. We, in the age of speed, learning how to get past any overwhelm while thriving at the same time is the expertise you'll take away from our first guest. With insights from his best-selling book, The Age of Speed and The Ant and the Elf, and a sneak peek into his upcoming book, Earthquake, you're going to hear from a man who went from recreational skier to the Olympics in just four years. Rocketing at an incredible 105 miles an hour on skis in the Winter Games, followed by 20 years of helping Fortune 500 companies go full speed ahead. And you'll get an invigorating and entertaining perspective on gliding through the demands we each face. Please, I can't, we can't hear your applause, but in the chat, please give us a thunderous applause for an inductee into the Speaker Hall of Fame in both Canada and the United States, Olympian, New York Times bestselling author, and second chair clarinet player in his high school band, hmm. Mr. Vince Pacenti. All right. Welcome, Vince. All right, I'm looking for the button. <laughs> oh, you are on. Oh, you I am. On. Oh, you I didn't. On. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Surprise. <laughs> well, thank you. You know what, Ravi, I'm, I'm such a massive fan. When you called, I don't even think I got to the end of the email before I typed back yes. <laughs> so, so you, thank you. You just are always out front, just about trying to make a difference. And uh, the theme of resilience and ramp up resilience, uh, you know, I don't know if we ever arrive at that, but uh, happy to be a guest and uh, kicking this off for you. Well, thank you. I mean, the. I'm seeing the mental health challenges people are dealing with coming out of this, right? After a year of this, there's so much heaviness, so much going on. And, you know, it used to be that, um, well, one in three people sometime in their lives would have a mental health challenge. Well, one of our guests this week shared with me that the latest data is that one in two people now are suffering from just depression. Yeah let alone the rest. There's a lot that we have to deal with as leaders. It's about looking after ourselves so we can support others. Yeah, there, there is, uh, you know, I'll always, uh, when I get requests from certain groups, nonprofits and that kind of thing, I try and help wherever I can. And one of them was uh, the University of New Mexico, their athletic program. And they really, uh, each state is different here in the States. I am a Canadian, proud Canadian. But I met a Texas mm -hmm. gal, so well, here, you know, here I am <laughs> in Texas. But uh, goodness gracious, there were there were kids, friends of these kids who had committed suicide. I mean, these are athletes; these are driven people. And uh, what I didn't see coming was what a, a boost this Olympic story has, and the the being able to address certain challenges and uncertainty. 
and how that correlates with the the mental health issues that these kids are dealing with. And they're what, 18 to 22 years old. So they're still formulating their adult behavior and, you know, mixing creativity and hope and innovation with uh, the realistic uh, notions in society where you have to step in and engage and all that. And uh, anyways, it was just such a, a, um, a need to be able to step in and give these kids some ideas and hope of what they could do and how they can supersede these thoughts. Because the, the insidious nature of depression is it can take hold and create some devastation in, in someone's lives. And that's, uh, that's actually a, a bit what the next book is all about too. Right. Now, <clears throat> before we dive into that, we were chatting backstage about resilience that, the, that there, there, you know, there, there's maybe a different perspective on that. Can you share a little bit about your thoughts on that? How resilient not be what people are thinking of? Yeah. Well, knowing your theme, ramp up resilience and, and paying attention to that, I think there's this cursory uh, default that we have about resilience of just being persistent. But think that resilience without clarity is basically stubborn ignorance, right? <laughs> you, you can be in this state of stubborn ignorance, and we all know people that have that kind of default in their own world. And to, to, to think that just to be resilient is going to see you through, it's not gonna see you through to anything unless you have clarity of where that's gonna, where you are going right. to end up or where you want to go or the path you need to choose. Uh, so this, um, this is an important topic to be able to blend your resilience and we can always expand like the comfort zone. You can expand the mm -hmm. levels of deservability you can expand, but you can also expand your resilience quotient, if you will, um, a little bit at a time only when you're so clear on where you're headed and, and the kinds of things that you can it's almost like north on a compass, you know, and it's an old right. cliche, but if you don't know where that north is for you. Uh, resilience, I think, is has a lot to do with stubborn ignorance. And I hate to be callous, but it, that's the way I see it. Okay, so I think we're pretty much on the same page because for me, there are stages to get through. You have to be able to step out of the stress response, but then that, that for mm -hmm. me, that north is purpose. Or yep. what I talk about is your core, which is uh, your purpose, your unique gift, and your sense of self. And that's yeah. the compass to take forward. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the Pixar movie Soul? I haven't yet, but it's on my list. Check it out. Because there is this, uh, they actually go beyond the level of purpose. And I'll leave it up to you to take a peek at that movie and see what can pull from that. But it supersedes purpose to... Why are we on this planet? What are we meant to do? You know, and they, they they have a thing in there, the great beyond, and they have another thing called the great before. You know, yeah. And I had some good friends down here in Texas who are really way right, conservative, Christian. You know, and they said, "Well, is it Christian? Like, is it you know <laughs> this uh, this thing?" And I said, "Well, yeah. It's it's just it kind of dances around this topic of purpose and yeah. And, uh, well, I will definitely watch it this week then. That's the recommendation. Yeah." yeah. And uh, we, we've got, uh, Caroline is saying that the entertainment industry is facing the similar issues now, particularly touring employees who are not only lost their jobs and careers, but also their entire network accommodations insurance. So she's looking forward to how to support them. That's, yeah. So Yeah. There's a lot of damage out there that uh, we can all play a part in. So in helping, not the damage. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> So, to, before we dive into the earthquake, which is, I think, and I, how much better a metaphor could you get for this last year? Right. Uh, for those people who have not read The Ant and the Elephant, can you give a, a Reader's Digest of that so they yeah. get a framing of how it connects? I don't know if you've ever met Dr. Lee Poulos. I mean, he's on the other coast from where you are, but... Uh... Dr. Poulos would be about 87 now, maybe 88, and just an extraordinary force of the mental health, mental training, worked with the Canadian Olympic team, the Edmonton Oilers. He gave a speech uh, about the ratio of activity of the conscious and subconscious mind. And one thing that pulled from that was in a second of time, 
your conscious mind is processing with 2,000 neurons. So in a second of time, your conscious mind is, is you know, listening to what I have to say. You might be thinking, oh, that makes sense. Tell me more. You might be thinking, oh, what's for lunch today? You know, you might be thinking, uh, that guy looks the old man from up. I don't know what, what, what you're thinking consciously, but in that same second, your subconscious mind, sub meaning below consciousness, is processing with 4 billion neurons. 2,000 conscious, 4 billion subconscious. Now, who's in control, right? Mathematically, the subconscious mind. We know that to be true, but that really is the grand illusion. We, we you know, you can decide, you can have an intention of where you want to go. So the ratio of activity between the conscious and subconscious mind is the exact same ratio between an ant and an elephant. The ant is the conscious mind on the back of the elephant. And the ant and the elephant, uh, when I heard his speech, I had to be on it. In fact, it ended up being part of my first book about the concept, the ant and the elephant. And I was stepping onto a plane realizing, wait a minute, this could be a book. This could be a parable. This could be the ant makes a decision to go west and starts marching west. But what if the elephant is headed east? Does the ant, A, see elephant? No. It doesn't see elephant, it just sees a gray landscape and it's marching along the back of the elephant going, I'm going west because that's where we intend to go. I'm going west. But if the elephant is headed east, you can end up in a completely different place that you intended on being. You know, I, I, I want to go on a diet, subconscious mind, I don't think so. <laughs> it might have all these reasons why not and they're subconscious, they're below conscious thoughts. So we can scratch our head and go, hey, relationships health, fitness, finance, whatever, we can make an intention yet end up in a different place. And the flip side of that is how extraordinary would it be, Ravi, if you had your conscious, your aunt, an elephant headed in the same direction? What if you had 4 billion neurons headed in that exact same direction? And so the ant and the elephant is this, is this methodology of being able to create that kind of alignment. And so what, and you mentioned a bit about the Olympic story. It, it, when I was 26 years old, living in Calgary, I had never ski raced before. And four years later, I was vying for the gold medal in the Olympic games four years after our Olympics in Calgary. Okay. So how does that happen? Right. That happened. The summary, summary of that is I had my aunt and elephant headed in the exact same direction. And things get easier when you have that kind of alignment. So uh, the ant and elephant has been, shoot, uh, LeBron James quoted it in Sports Illustrated not too long ago. Because the, when you write a book, it, it kind of has a life of its own. Yeah. FedEx uses it as a leadership tool. DuPont. I mean, it's, it's just created this kind of its own little groundswell. So yeah, and if you haven't read it, I really, really recommend you pick it up. It's phenomenal, and it just makes it so simple. Yeah, yeah, Clear. yeah. Simple, yeah. Simple's better, is <laughs> oh, totally. It's not rocket science. I can tell you that I'm a rocket scientist. Yeah, consider the source, and you know that that's <laughs> not my wheelhouse. Rocket yeah. science. <laughs> So, so that's the ant and the elephant. Now, I, I think I know where it's going, but the earthquake is yeah. what happens when the elephant, I'm guessing, gets turned, you know, upside right. down. Well, that that that's the insidious nature of a of an earthquake is there's aftershocks, mm -hmm. and so I did shop the book around to make publishers, and um, they said, well, it's a sequel. It's, it's more of the same thing, and that. No. In fact, I ended up going with Ben Bella Publishers out of the States here. Uh, just love those guys because they really partnered in this book becoming what it is. And so we've got an October 5th launch date. So whenever you're hearing this, uh, I know we've got people on live right now, but the, the, the book starts with this line. There is no linear way out of chaos. When we experience an earthquake, a personal earthquake, and that could be anything from divorce to cancer to bankruptcy to, oh, let's call it a pandemic. <laughs> you know, whenever we, we experience an earthquake, uh, the, my wife says it's like the rug's being yanked out from under you. Just picture that for a second, standing there, and then the rug is literally yanked out from under you. What does that do to your, your stability? What does that do to your life? What does that do to your perspective? 
And what does that do to normal? And when we have a massive setback, a personal earthquake, this chaos has us get into the state of stuckness. And we all, I don't care who you are, and I, the reason this, this book is actually autobiographical. <laughs> I went through such a massive, massive earthquake in 2008. And the reaction I get when I tell people of this is, oh, we all did. I said, yeah, I don't think you put $2 million in two different places at the exact same time and loved yourself to the hilt <laughs> and was just absolutely devastated. To this day, I'm getting aftershocks from that mistake, right? And the way out of this earthquake is not linear. The, the, the ant and the elephant is a very linear methodology, right? Yeah. Clarify where you want to go. Have the emotional buzz, the elephant buzz. Commit, step in. Commit is a process of not, it's not episodic. You have to commit and stay the course. Consistency. Consistency is about that excellence mindset where it's always doing what the, I say competition is not willing to do in my speeches, but the book is about this consistent effort that's always like drops of dye bucket. You can't see right. the incremental difference, but over time, uh, confidence. Confidence has everything to do with peak performance, but what if you don't have the experience? So building confidence as you go without the experience and then control, you can't control the environment, control what you bring to the environment. So great formula, work great, work to get to the Olympic games, work to the New York Times list, work to Hall of Fame speaker, all these kind of accolades or milestones. Yeah, great, okay, yippee. And it doesn't work when you go through a, an earthquake. I, I mean, I was at this very desk crying in my hands going, I don't know how to get out of this. Like, I don't know what to do. Uh, and uh, there was one moment in the, gosh, I'm bringing this out of the, the file cabinet, but uh, of my brain. But uh, I mean, our electricity was being shut off. I was, you know, begging them to put it back on. And I was taking money that was owed over here. And the phone was ringing you know, people, why do you want our money? And it was just, and I wasn't going to go bankrupt. And I just kept staying in the course. And, and my gas tank was on empty. There was no money. Credit cards have been canceled. I mean, this was a dumpster fire of a life. And here I'm supposed to be the guy, the motivational guy, whatever. And I went to the uh, cigarette uh, where, the, um, where the ashtray is, right? You know, the, something we never use anymore. And uh, pulled out uh, $7.25 in quarters and went into the gas station and pushed all these quarters across the table. And who's standing there but two of the moms that were, I don't know, friends. They were moms and my daughter's friends. Uh, you know the the talky talk person people that kind of like to they kind of revel in yeah. talking about other people. The, the, the two worst people to witness this, if, if there was any kind of self-esteem left, it was gone at this point. $7.25 quarters across the table to put some gas in my car to get home and, and move around. I'm, I'm, you know, and I was absolutely uh, uh, confused as maybe not even a strong enough word. I, I, I was absolutely amazed at how, what got us here to any kind of achievement wasn't working to get out of an earthquake. I, I'm just, you said this was 2008. After from 2008 till yeah years after yeah because because I'm just realizing that I just sort of flashed back 2007 was I ran the first Halifax Caps convention you got inducted into the Speaker Hall of Fame so it was right after that I'm just right after that cluing. yeah top of the world yeah top of the world couldn't do anything wrong in fact that was at that exact same time I was making mo more in a speech in an hour speech than I'd made in my job when I got out of University of Alberta in sports marketing. I, I mean, I, I was on top of the world. Top, I was thinking about what Jetta was going to buy, right? Yeah. Anyway. So uh, what's yeah. the way out when you're in that place? And everything you know does not work, which is very true for the last year. Yeah. Well, I call it in the book, I call it solution loop. So I'll give you kind of a hint on what those are, because I just, uh, I, I, I tend to want to kind of make sure that you've got a, um, a grasp of what this is. And the first part of the solution loop is to 
understand that there is a contradiction between your con in an earthquake and after an earthquake, a, a contradiction between what your conscious mind is thinking. And I gave you some ideas of that right now. Like I know how to accomplish a goal. I know how to take a massive goal and turn it into reality. Done it before, done it over and over again. The ant and the elephant lays it all out. Knock yourself out. <laughs> but what happens is, and you touched on it earlier, Robbie, is that the elephant turn in a different direction and it's subconscious. You can't, the ant does not see elephant. It right. doesn't see this gray landscape. It doesn't even, it can think you're going west. You can have the intention of doing what you want and end up in a completely place and it just got worse and worse and worse in terms of, of thinking, okay, I've got this. And I was using all the tools I used to get to the Olympics and it, they weren't working. Uh, so there can be a contradiction and think of it this, it's like, think of it as a relationship between the conscious and subconscious mind, much like a, a primary relationship, like my wife and I, right? And so let's say my wife and I are riding or you and your sister, significant other are in, in a vehicle. This is the vehicle, right? But you each have a steering wheel. The conscious and subconscious mind has a steering wheel. And, and this is playing out in our world today. This is a really interesting book concept because there is a polarity that exists. And we're seeing a divide, a polarity get bigger and bigger, especially in the US and I think in Canada to a degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and around the world, we're just seeing this. The, and what happens is I know how to steer this vehicle says the conscious mind, says me in my relationship, says you and your relationship. And guess what's happening with the other steering wheel? They're yanking it around too. Go, no. It, and so there is a contradiction. There's, there's a dysfunction going on when both are trying to steer this vehicle. By understanding this contradiction is the next step of being able to say, okay, we have to, you have to let go of the steering wheel. And that is not in our nature, especially when we want to get things going in the right direction. You mean let go, let go? Are you kidding me? But both, both entities in this relationship, the conscious and subconscious mind need to let go. How do you force the subconscious mind to let go? How, uh, let's say you're in nature and um, let's say there's an actual earthquake. Right? You can intend to let go all day long and the earth, mother nature is going to go, no, I'm in this is the way it's going to be, right? There is this um, acceptance of this contradiction, which then allows us to create a new alignment. And the new alignment is, is, a, is this inflection point of saying, okay, we'll figure out this third reality that we don't know what it is just yet. So in a world of instant gratification, I'm not making anybody happy right now, right? Because no, 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 give me the pill, give me the solution. What is it, what is it to make this alignment happen? Uh, from there, then there's the, the necessity to be very curious and creative. And there's unlimited numbers of possibilities of being able to, to find a new solution. Remember, it's called the solution loop. But to take those unlimited opportunities of being that you're curious about, be creative, which will maybe this works. Does this work? Does this work? Does this work? And so in this solution loop, you can eventually hopefully reach something that has traction and traction, you know, with action means that something's going to take you out of this stuckness. Um, if you've ever been around somebody that's stuck in poverty, you know, we, yeah. we uh, build homes of hope. We've, our family has built homes of hope. And when we build a home for this family, it is an inflection point that for them to get out of the stuckness because there is stuckness in this uh, insidious nature of, of an earthquake. In their case, poverty, right? And they just stay stuck and stay stuck and stay stuck. So uh, that's, I just gave away the whole book, actually. <laughs> but uh, I saved you 20 bucks. All right. So, no. well, the thing is, though, I, I got a question for you, though. You say the letting go of the wheel. Yeah. What comes to mind for me there is what you will deal with then, and it's very much subconscious, is, is often a very primal terror barrier. 
because uh, it's it's like hanging above what seems to be a hundred foot drop, and you're saying let go, mm -hmm. and trust that there's a ledge there that you can or you can find a ledge, right? How do you when you're in the midst of that when all your senses just like a steering are saying do not let go of the wheel, yeah, the car will go out of control. What are strategies that you found yourself through that time, 2008, 2009, since to be able to let go? Yeah, of that? I think that, that that metaphor, I get what you're saying, but I would tend to lean in the direction of faith over force, right? Okay, say more. I think we tend to force a situation of force away, and there's, there's a certain amount of faith, uh, and I, I'm not just thinking about religious faith or spiritual faith i'm talking about faith in its entirety that you there is this place where you can you can get solace and clarity for just letting go right um and this if we can let go of this notion that we have to force thing the rugged individualism or whatever I, that you know that was my factory is my factory defect right i'm a recovering mm -hmm. perfectionist i'm a recovering rugged individualist how did i get to the olympic games i'm i i it, it was almost this path of i'm gonna make this happen and not realizing how much other people had participated in that journey um yeah if i could turn back time i would be probably far more aware that rugged individualism is, is can be very damaging to your psyche. So we're all on our path and that's this, the, the earthquake is this seek the ant and the elephant going through an earthquake and then the journey. And in, in this book, uh, I, I, I'd love to send you a pre-copy actually to get your feedback on this because love to. the idea here is that if it's a parable, I, there's a lot of this and personal parables out there, who moved my cheese or whatever. And the stories are pretty, um, I don't know, It's the, they made the content more important. I wanted more important. I wanted this story to stand alone. I wanted you to go, that happened, right? So it's a very much a story forward. They go through so many experiences that are, then that happened, then this happened, then that happened. It's like, oh my God. How are you going to get out of that mess, right? And uh, there's a few unexpected twists and turns. But that's the curiosity and the exploring and the what if and the what if. Yeah, over and over. yeah, because we are stubborn. We we are in, in stubborn and ignorance is kind of our own, you know, factory default. <laughs> we can we can think we're resilient, and I was being stubborn and ignorant, and uh, and there is a way out, and the way out of any kind of earthquake is that curiosity and creativity that's part of the solution loop to be able to stay there and does this work does this work does this work and you know it can take months if not years to kind of find your way out of that stuckness because it can it can keep your it's like remember that uh, cousin who was just a jackass who held your head underwater and thought that was funny you know in the pool <laughs> right it's like no that can that could be what it feels like so you know. So that two things come, pop to mind then. One is, is it's I think of the, the story of Edison who went through 10,000 tries before he found the light bulb, what worked, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. it just, what if, what if this, what if this, what if this? Right. But the, the other thing I wanted to ask you is, you know, you know I used to be a physicist, right? My first career and I worked yeah. with chaotic systems. I forgot that, So yeah. <clears throat> I'm hearing a lot of that in what you're saying because you talk about chaos. Yeah. And the the secret with chaos what people tend to do is they try to over control and over analyze the situation and and i've got to be in control and and the real uh power in um chaotic systems are the simple the uh the the pressure points there's tiny little spots that you put a little bit in here a little bit in there and the whole system shifts Mm -hmm. And is that aligned with what you're speaking of in the solution? That solution loop is looking for those leverage points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It definitely was. These little inflection points are, uh, and you've heard me talk about this before, soul taps, you know. Mm -hmm. I talk about soul taps in, in respect to that there, there's these, these little taps we get on the shoulder that simply mean this, pay attention. You don't have to interpret, uh, you know, I've, I've had friends who they're, mom passed away and a butterfly 
signifies that their mom's spirit is still there. When they see a butterfly, they go, oh, that's mom, right? And, um, and I'd like to take that a step further. And those kind of things where you, where you register something, instead of understanding that it's this, and I'm not making them wrong. I'm saying that you can supersede it the next level. And it's like a tap on the shoulder. It's like, pay attention. Like, pay attention to what? Well, just pay attention because there is these inflection points that can happen as we go. Um, there's so much in our lives that we think we know, right? And uh, there's, there's only so much awareness you can have with 2,000 neurons every second. Four yeah. billion neurons in that second have an, uh, an amazing awareness. And um, there is, think of it this way. You know, we've got a dog, his name's Cosmo, right? He just walked by my doors over here. He wants to come in, not coming in. <laughs> but if I were to explain math or physics, Cosmo, he would just look at us like, what are you talking about, <laughs> right? No idea. There is an awareness, that the limited awareness that we have, that we have no comprehension of. Right. And so that's part of the faith over force quotient is to is to say, OK, I don't get it, but I have faith that if I'm really clear on, like you said, purpose or the ability to be able to be in integrity with what we are uh, with this alignment, and I call it the emotional buzz is when when a thought creates a physical reaction. It's a litmus test for your conscious 2,000 neurons and subconscious mind going in the same direction. If there's discord, you've got 4 billion neurons headed in a different direction. And it, of course, it's going to be difficult. Of course, willpower is not going to get you through this. Of course, resilience on its own won't get you through this. And that's why resilience with clarity creates this, uh, it sets you up for moment, momentum. Uh, the problem with chaos is there's no linear way out of chaos. There is going to be a circuitous, like, does this, this work? We're going to make 10 steps back. Edison, 10,000. How many of the 9,999 was like, what is it going to take? You know, um, and another thing I wanted to mention, I forget her first name, Dweck, talks about um, mindset. Mm -hmm. And the growth mindset, and I think the, she calls it the stuck mindset, but the growth right. mindset is this, uh, the metaphor I use in the book is between um, vines and a cactus, right? The vines seek the light. Do they have any kind of pattern to what they're seeking? No, there's light over there, there's light over there. They're seeking the growth mindset, right? Uh, the cactus is gonna have, you know, roots. It's gonna be prickly. It's gonna say, I'm good, I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, <laughs> you know, and that, that's also okay, right? The pandemic taught us that, you know, staying put and being able to, to find this kind of growth in this stuckness, if you will, is yeah. also a powerful um, thing to embrace. Uh, but what if you had the, the ability to be the cactus and the vine, you know, to have both? And that's the conscious and subconscious mind, the relationship and being able to have both of us let go of the steering wheel and then find that... Um, that that new alignment that can create this kind of momentum that may work or it might not and then you go back into the solution loop so uh, right yeah so let's take this down into um for business owners for leaders who yeah. have to manage themselves but have other people looking to them mm -hmm. so what are you know with with the world turns inside outside upside down the last year what do you think are some specific steps that they could take to be able to step back and start exploring the solution loop for themselves or for their teams? Well, the best example I could think of is Coca-Cola. Uh, when mm -hmm. they, in the mid eighties, then some of you don't know this story, but uh, you and I distinctly remember <laughs> when Coca-Cola introduced the new Coke, right? Mm -hmm. Coca freaking Cola. <laughs> like they could do it. They had done exhaustive taste tests. They knew they had a superior tasting product. They knew from, from all these studies that this, then they were doing these banners and billboards saying it's coming on those coming on makes that whatever date it was. And you were going, what Coca-Cola, what? And then they introduced the new Coke and they did not know the earthquake they were about to experience, right? They had 
they had a consumer revolt. People picketing, saying, I'm never going to drink Coke again. <laughs> and Coke was like, wait a minute, wait. And so they went. You love this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they went through an earthquake, right? They sat down with a, a guy not too far from here named Jim Krupe. from live in Dallas, Texas. And uh, Krupe sat down with senior Coke executives. And I'm going to paraphrase here for a second and use my own terminology, but he said, what's your mission statement? What's your vision for the world? What's your purpose, right? And they said, oh, our mission statement is whatever, to be the premier soft drink provider, providing maximum stakeholder value, blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So inspiring. Right. And they changed it in the mid 80s during an earthquake of theirs, of their own making, <laughs> which we do to ourselves too. And they changed it to this put a Coke within reach of every human being on the planet. They simplified it to include the emotional buzz. Because when something has an emotional buzz attached to it, and an employee of Coca-Cola, whether they were a receptionist or they were delivering Coca-Cola or the marketing executive or whatever they were, they had one job, put a Coke within reach of every human being on the planet. Mm-hmm. At the end of every corridor of every Coke facility, they've shortened it now, and it says a Coke within reach. They are so fucked up about that singular emotional buzz that that is what a leader can do, not just for your inner, um, in the interior of your company, but the external as well, the internal and external is being able to have this resonance of saying, this is who we are, this is what we do. And the pandemic for many leaders had this definitive uh, opportunity for leaders to go, okay, wait a minute, we have to get back to our basics. Yeah. Um, and and uh, for my business and my, my circle and the people I employ and all that, uh, we went immediately when the pandemic hit, it was, um, I basically said to him, this is going to last maybe about three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and, I, and I said, we are going to push out value. And uh, as you know, I've pushed out over 250 videos, right? Because going to do a video a day until the pandemic is over in three weeks. <laughs> three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 250 video. I trimmed it back to, I did five videos a week because I just, I gave everybody a break on the weekend, including yours truly, but uh, you know, and made sure that they had value from it. And what's value? Well, not saying stuff that's obvious, you know, because I think Shakespeare said, never state the obvious. I might be wrong on that, but somebody said it, never state the obvious. Well, these videos were all, would always be something you go, Oh yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. Okay. So, Try that 250 times over and over again. And it, it pushes you as a leader to lead by example and keep moving forward, you know, so. Um, so tell me if, if I'm getting this, understanding you right, in terms of what to do, the metaphor I'm getting is sort of to Marie Kondo your business and your life. Say that again, to do what? Marie Kondo your business and your life. Like oh, she's, the one who, she, she's the one who cleans out closets and gets rid of over, you know, simplify, 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 right? Oh, oh okay. I don't in your know. closet, you hold something in your hand and you ask, does it bring me joy? And if no, it's gone. Oh, I've heard of her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so it's about, but what you're talking about is doing that with your business and saying, is this what we're doing? Is it core to me? Doing that with your time. And mm -hmm. saying, is this nourishing me or nourish people? And if not, am I yeah. on track with that? Exactly. And and get this. I mean, and we've we've been having to come face to face with this because the only way to clean a closet is to empty it. Mm -hmm. And if you are in the middle of mess right now, that is a really good sign <laughs> because you have been forced to empty your closet and decide what it is you're going to keep, right? You, you, there's a personality traits. And when you take in a couple in the ant and the elephant metaphor, uh, many of the, the ways we think, the unconscious beliefs, attitudes, and truths, B-A-T, beliefs, attitudes, and truths, most of those are subconscious. 
Yes. We're not aware that we have that belief, attitude, or truth. You know, this is the grand illusion. The ant on the back of the elephant doesn't see elephant. We, we think we know what our beliefs, attitudes, and truths are. We think we know where West is. We think we know that we're marching along on the ground to where we head, but we're on the back of an elephant, and who knows where that's headed? Well, you, I could tell you where it's headed. It's, it's look at your results and go, oh. <laughs> I yeah, I mean, for us, we know our elephant. Look around your life. That's yeah. your elephant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So be able to empty that closet, be in the middle of a mess. And this is this, we're getting back to resilience again. This clarity is about what is truly impor important. Now, that's what to do. How do you have that kind of clarity? Uh, you know, it, it's it's curious, curiosity and creativity. Does this work? Does this work? Does this work? And it's being able to, there is a litmus test for this, by the way. There is a way to know if you have alignment of your ant and elephant. And is it, if it has a physical reaction, if a thought creates a physical reaction, that's that soul tap. That's that pay attention on the shoulder. The second thing you want to kind of overlay with that is, does it scare you, right? Mm -hmm. Not only does is it aspirational, like marching in the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games. I had no business. I'd never ski raced before. I had no business stepping into that, except there was something of the opening ceremonies. There was something about being an Olympic athlete. <laughs> and I don't know why. But in the same breath, if it scares you, then it's important to you. Stephen Pressfield uh, wrote a book called The War of Art. And one of the aspects of this book that Pressfield wrote was if it scares you, it's important to you. Now, I know I'm paraphrasing, but if it's important to you and it scares you, think of the, the coupling of aspirational, what you would love to build or create or be a part of, your purpose, for example. And what if you coupled that with something that scares you? You have, you have added rocket fuel to what it is you want to be able to accomplish or create or build well, to be a part of. One of my mentors once said that you've got the right goal if you're crazy excited about it and crazy terrified with it. Yeah, yeah. It's, then you're on track. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to capture something else too before we lose it, but... Um, you know, you said about, you know, the closet is in chaos. The, the key I'm getting here is not to put everything back as it was because we've got a year or many months, a lot of business, for example, businesses without going into the office. Uh, you know, and if you had asked people in January to 2020, can your people work from home? They go, oh, no, you can't do that again. And, and yet, Boom, guess what? Most of North America for at least a few months managed to do it. And there's now many businesses saying, we're not going to go back to bricks and mortar. Yeah. So what else is there that you have put aside that you've, you're actually functioning without doing and shouldn't, is, is that is that part of the cleaning out that's saying, no, let's not yeah. put it back in. Yeah. Let's just that's, that was the first thought I had was it's just more, it adds to clarity, you know. Things can be in focus, and the focus can come clear. If you've ever seen the televisions we used to look at, right? And then when uh, you know high definition came, I was like, Whew. "Well, you just go to Best Buy or whatever and see these, uh, you know, the difference between regular HD and this four um, uh, K. Oh my goodness! Well, now there's eight K. Take a look at a four K and an eight K. Go, holy! Mo so this clarity can be better and better and better as it is uh, for ourselves. Uh, and you don't know it until you see it. You don't realize it until you're right face to face with it. You go, oh, that is clear. So you're, we're never on, we've never arrived at clarity. I, th I keep tending to think we, we have a bias about that kind of clarity. And it's, it's, uh, it's always evolving and it's always better. And, and um, hopefully before we leave this planet, we, we are always on that path to more clarity. Yeah. So now, Vince, you've got some uh, special resources that are available from your booth in in this this event, right? That for our for our uh, viewers. Yeah. 
I, well, the videos I referred to, uh, there's a mm -hmm. link, and you can uh, just I subscribe to those videos, and you're not going to get inundated by um, anything. You just kind of um, will have when the new video comes out. They're always less than two minutes. They're always meant to have you go, oh, I haven't thought of it that way. And uh, that's something I'd like to kind of have an outreach, just you know, give value to those who would like more value. So. Yeah. And, and they're amazing. I mean, like you say, just a minute or two and you just go, hmm. Yeah, sometimes they're just 45 seconds. Um, yeah, so meant to be. I love, yeah, meant to I be love that you started it for just, no, it's just the 21 days of the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, any last thoughts that you have for, uh, for the people attending? Because this is just day one now of the four day summit. Yeah, I, 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 so it, uh, under the banner of resilience. I, I think we also default to the Hollywood version of resilience. Like you, this person who's maniacally obsessed about a goal and just will not give up and not shit. Uh, my bias is that this resilience thing is meant to be fun, right? If you can have fun on this journey, think of the opposite end of the universe from fear, right? Which we've had an abundance of and can be so, like I said, insidious in nature where it can drag us down, it's be held your head underwater. That's just, but the opposite end is just fun. It's just enjoying this. And um, that's a decision as well. So decide, this is gonna be fun. I did it prior to this call with you right here. Is this, well, let's just have fun. You know, if we're making a difference, it's because people are drawn towards others who wanna have fun, so. And I know so, you the same way. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to push you on, on with what happened in 2008, 2009. Yeah. How long did it take you to get to say, okay, I'm going to have fun? Yeah, good fun. point. Well, yeah, there's a little detour there. Okay. If there is a knife in your leg and someone said, just have fun, you're going to go, there's a knife in my leg. <laughs> you know? How are you going to possibly have fun? So, it, it, you know, to say, oh, I've got clarity, you want to create and build and all this, there's a knife in my leg. So when we are so distracted by what's causing pain, that has to be addressed, right? Uh, uh, and it's, it's uh, yeah, to, to put that pain in a closet, to say, oh, I'm just not going to pay attention to that right now. No, it has to be addressed. And I'll, I'll bring up a Canadian, John Amat, first Canadian to climb Mount Everest. And he said, uh, when you run away from fear, it gets larger. Mm -hmm. When you go towards it, it gets smaller. So to go directly to the middle of that, that is where the learning is, is in discomfort. Think of all the times in your life that you learned a lesson, right? Were you comfortable or uncomfortable? Uh, so oddly enough, it's seek the discomfort, uh, seek these moments that are, what is it about that? And just start to unravel it in the, as best you can, but don't ignore it because that's, that is the beginning of mental health issues. Uh, and that can take hold to the degree where some give up, you know, and, uh, so for now, it's dealing with the stressors, maybe getting professional for support so that then you can start moving things forward. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank I, you. I make a little detour here again. Another one. Yeah. This is a boring stories from all over the place. John um, Gray wrote Men Are From Mars, mm -hmm. from Venus. And I actually confirmed this story with John the last time I was with him because I said, I've, sold, I've told this story so many times. Is, is it really that way? He says, yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, so, and it's actually really, I don't know, kind of a downer to end on this, but <laughs> it, it is. His, his we have three is, more days to bring us up. Okay, please, Patricia Morgan, step up. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that you're on here, yeah. Um, so anyways, and Michelle Setterberg, oh, love that gal. And I don't know your other... The, Kate look. Collins. Okay, oh, Collins. All right, so quickly, John and his brother got a phone call that the, the dad had been carjacked, stuffed into the trunk in uh, west uh, East Texas, and some guy drugged out. Uh, the dad died of heat exhaustion in the trunk of his own car. Uh, they went to the funeral, and um, 
both John and his brother, and John's not very tall. He's maybe five, five. And uh, he got into the trunk of the car at the impound lot and wanted to see what his dad had gone through. Closed the trunk lid, the heat in the trunk immediately started to go up to the degree that he went, wow, this was a desperate situation from the get go. And uh, he could tell how his dad had tried to pry open the latch to open the trunk. He, he could tell how his dad had punched out the um, tail light to try and reach around because it was a, a, a BMW, I think five series where, you know, remember the button, you can press the button. It just opens up. It was unless it's locked and it wasn't locked. It was just, uh, it was unlocked. And uh, John tried to reach out and couldn't open the trunk and realize why his dad died because he couldn't help himself. Uh, and then he heard his brother's voice on the outside of the car going, you're close. You just have to angle your hand in and down. And when John did that, he was able to press the button and let himself out. And he, when the trunk opened, I realized never to underestimate the value of an outside perspective. So for we're in this together. And uh, if this interview had something to do with that outside perspective, great. If there's an outside perspective that you can be proactive about, that's part of being resilient is whether it's counseling, it, it's about an outside perspective, you know, so. Um, it totally is. Yeah. And, and we all need help in us. You cannot. All of us. I, I, it, and as much as you think you can do it on your own, this rugged individualism, uh, we're all fragile. All of us. All of us <laughs> are fragile. And, uh, and there are moments where we need, we need uh, an outside perspective and help. And so hopefully this is part of it. Thank you so much. I truly appreciate it, Vince. You are incredible. And please, folks, I've got a special announcement coming up, but please give him a thunderous applause in the, in the, uh, the chat or with the smileys at the bottom of your screen. Truly grateful for this time with you, Vince. Likewise, and I uh, can't wait to see everybody else's contribution. This is, uh, you're onto something here, Rob. Take care. Thank you so much. And I uh, just wanted to remind you folks that uh, the next three days, tomorrow, Michelle Cedarberg is gonna take you through the Success Energy Equation, her new book about how do you move forward in times. And that's actually where the timing of it has turned into a how to not just survive, but thrive through these uh, through these times. Kate Collins is coming in after her, and then Patricia Morgan with phenomenal value. The other thing I want to let you know is that there is a special bonus piece to the summit, a VIP session. It's where the main part of the summit, I'm bringing you these four incredible experts uh, to bring their ideas, their expertise, their techniques, their tools. Uh, this is a online retreat where I'll be sharing with you my resources and it'll be a hands-on workshop on May 2nd. If you are interested in joining that, I want to make sure the right people are there, that it's going to be value for you. I've set up a small questionnaire. If you can go to ravitangri.com slash VIP. Uh, and uh, and make sure that it's right for you. It is free, but it's. I want to make sure all the right people are there. And what Vince was talking about about you know it's it's the pulling the knife out, the healing, and then starting to move. There's a five step journey that I've discovered in working with my clients to what I call soul engineering your life to bring the heart and soul back into it. Um, and I'm going to take you through those five steps, plus give you some very specific techniques you can apply right there. That's why I want to make sure you learn those techniques there. So thank you for joining us today. Please go into, uh, we're going to keep the venue open for a while. Please go into the booths, check out the amazing resources that our sponsors and our speakers have for you. Uh, and also please say, take some time in the lounge and um, connect, network, uh, just as you would at an in-person event. Vince, can you stand in the lounge if uh, people would like to uh, ask you some questions? Is there beer? 
is that well I, i'll tell you the beer is as close as your fridge so, yeah. <laughs> I'm so in. How, about, how about you go to table one and anyone who wants to talk to vince pop into table one if you've got questions if you've got any insights any any feedback you'd like to give him thank you so much and we will see you tomorrow with the incredible michelle cedarberg thank you table one where do i find table 